<clears throat> the time is now 9-12 and this hearing is officially open. The members of the board are Eric Shav, Andrew Hames, Richard Bavone, Paylin Nee, and myself, Robert Peterson, Chairman from the Department of State is Mr. Courtney Nation and Mr. C.J. Ajoku. We will now hear the scheduled petitions. When you speak, please address the board and give your name, title, and legal address so that our court reporter can have all the information requested. We may have to stop from time to time to consult with our technical staff. In making comments to the board, please provide a descriptive narrative on matters referring to your exhibits to enable the court reporter to enter these into the record. The first case is a holdover from the December hearing, uh, petition number 2023-0431, petitioner's home church, Crystal Miller tenants. Okay, this petition pertains to 1,800 square feet, 1,800 square foot tent erected on a lot at 298 Neighborhood Road, Mastic Beach, I believe, town of Brookhaven, County of Suffolk, State of New York. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 3103.5, which states that temporary tents, air-supported, air-inflated, or tensioned membrane structures shall not be erected for a period of more than 180 days within a 12-month period. The petitioner wishes to maintain a tent structure in place for more than consecutive 180 days. And 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 3103.8.2, which states that tents or membrane structures shall not be located within 20 feet of lot lines, buildings, other tent or membrane structures, parked vehicles, or internal combustion engines. For the purpose of determining required distances, support ropes and guy wires shall be considered as part of the temporary membrane structure or tent. The petitioner wishes that a tent operational for more than 180 days be allowed to be less than 20 feet from the adjacent buildings and lot lines. Okay. I believe we had a Mr. Johnson last time. Yes, good morning, Your Honor. Um, How are you, sir? Very good. So I just wanted okay. to advise the board that since our last date, we have closed off the parking lot. No longer are any vehicles allowed in the lot when the tent is in use. Um, we also did purchase um, extension hoses for our heater, and we have moved the heater approximately 25 to 30 feet away from the tent. So I know those were concerns that the board raised during our last hearing date. Um, so we did take care of that. We also purchased additional heat sensors that are hooked up directly to Wi-Fi. Um, so we would get alerts if there's any spike in heat within the tent um, and we installed those. So we've, we've addressed everything that we could. Um, and at this point, we, we rely on the submission. Okay, um, I read the minutes this morning quickly. Um, on the meeting on the 14th of December, and there was emphasis on getting a violation that cites the code violations from the town of Brookhaven. Yes. So we can understand uh, what those deficiencies are. Um, I believe we have some people here today from the town of Brookhaven. Um, if you can, just state your name and title and... <laughs> What's that? Okay, Jim. We might not be able to see them on the video. Okay, is that necessary? No. Okay. I'm Frank Laz. I'm a principal board inspector. Good morning. All right, so um, have we visited the, the site? I have not. I was out the last week. This is really, this hearing is my first involvement in this. We have not received an application. Plans. Okay. Temporary ten structures are regulated by the fire marshal. Okay. All right, but I I don't know if this is going beyond the temporary structure. If they're trying to legalize it as a permanent structure, or they're seeking variances to maintain temporary structure for a long period of time. I'm not unclear on it. My understanding is that they want an extended period of time, uh, Mr. Johnson. Yes, so we're, we're not looking to make this a permanent structure. We were looking for a variance. For, we were asking for a one year variance because of how close it is to the property line. Um, because if we were to move the tent into the middle of the lot, as we stated, we only use the tent on Sundays and it would make the lot no longer usable for all the other tenants of that building. Okay, so setbacks, zoning setbacks would require variances from the town on Sunday. But would the zoning setbacks apply to a temporary? Uh, I believe they would. Our 
planning department does the commercial zoning. Um, I think the state code is more restrictive. I mean, we allow a 10 foot side yard, 25 foot rear yard. So I, I could say that back in um, 2022, when it was first raised, we did go to the town planning board and they told us that they can't issue anything because it's a temporary structure. Um, so that's been the difficulty that we've had. Um, we've been kind of stuck on a hamster wheel of trying to meet compliance, but there's nothing that we can comply with uh, according to the town. Okay. If Planning deemed it a temporary structure and said it doesn't have to comply with zoning, then I would say it has to comply with the state code as far as setbacks. And that's what um, it was previously uh, Mr. Flood from the legal department. He was the one who advised us to apply here to get the variance. That way we could take care of the violation that was written up on the ticket for no CO. Okay. You would still need a variance from the Board of Zoning if those four chapter 30. Also, because you're going to be on the allowed 30 minutes. Yes. And I was told, but I have been told a lot of things. Uh, I was told once we get a variance here that we would be able to submit the variance from this board to the town, and that would most likely um, help us satisfy that requirement. Uh, Fire Marshal Mattel, you have anything you want to add? Sure. Uh, again, it's Michael Mattel, Jr., Community Fire Marshal, Town of Brookhaven. I have been to this site. I've been involved in this uh, since approximately December 9th of 2020, um, where I was uh, sent on a, a typical complaint uh, received uh, for a tent remembering structure being built on a, on a, on a parcel. Uh, before I went out, I did check the uh, Fire Marshal's records. Uh, who issued the, perm the uh, temporary 10 permits, and we had no record on file of an application or permit being issued for it. Uh, when I arrived, I was with a town law investigator um, since retired, but uh, the uh, tent structure was was erected as a canopy at that point. There were no sides on the uh, on the canopy, and it was located in the southeast corner of the lot. It was obvious that other work was being done. There was a large pile of uh, aggregate that was going to be spread out in the parking lot and, and so forth. Um, no, if I'm not mistaken, there was no one present at the time. The uh, law investigator, after his research, did issue a summons, a town summons, for uh, constructing and occupying without a certificate of occupancy uh, from building. That is still pending, to the best of my knowledge, the town attorney's office at home. So again, I uh, I tried to make contact over the course of multiple years. We did speak on what I'm not saying I didn't get contacts. I certainly did. I spoke with um, the pastor. I spoke with Mr. Johnson on multiple occasions through email and or in person. I visited the site multiple times. I was in their office, which is adjacent to it on a separate parcel. Um, early on in the process, they had mentioned to me that they were applying for COVID accommodations for the use of the tent. Um, I didn't understand the reason for COVID accommodations being, my assumption was COVID accommodations was to maintain a, an occupying, a current business, i.e. a restaurant is operating, being restricted due to COVID, uh, allowances will be made to have a, a tent structure put on the outside to bring their occupancy back up to close to what it was, and they can operate under a certain period of time. We didn't have any history of any church operating on this parcel so we didn't see that there was a maintenance thing. It was a new occupancy for this location not a maintenance of an existing number one number two the policy in the town was that all uh covid accommodations would go I think they may have disconnected. Yeah. Um, let me call them. Okay, hold on.
Um, um, I'm sorry, um, uh, Mr. Fire Marshal. Could you go over from oh about the three or four paragraphs? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, about that. to the COVID portion of it, or um, that. Yeah. The the court reporter, do you know what what where was the last time we lost connection with uh, fire marshal? Does the court reporter? Um, I would have to backtrack in the recording to find that. Okay. What was the what was the last thing recorded? That, yes, you'd have to go into She's recording. Oh, okay. Okay. I, 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 recording the. Oh, this technology driving me crazy. Um, okay. Um, yeah, you could. You could. So, all right. Well, we, we talked about the uh, COVID accommodations and how, uh, my view, it was not a maintenance of an existing church, but it was a new facility because there was never a church on that property previously, uh, according to town records. There was no, no church there. Uh, so, COVID accommodations didn't appear to. Uh, to follow, but they still file for it or have the application. And the, the last step in the COVID accommodation, if a tent or canopy is going to be used to increase or to maintain your occupancy levels, it will come to the fire marshal office for review. That never made it to our office. So the COVID application accommodations never followed the complete path and made it or, and of course, never issued because we never received that application in our office. And that was checked with the chief fire marshal who did all the reviews. COVID accommodations. Uh, so back in 2020 to 2021, those accommodations were never, never uh, issued. Um, multiple uh, times I've stopped out at the at the location. I found that now the the uh, canopy has now become a tent, and that it was completely enclosed with side walls. Now I do say the tent was a quality tent. It appeared to have proper flame retardant certificates on the uh, the side walls that I found laying outside while they were still packaged. Uh, I have never done an interior inspection of the tent. I, I never had the opportunity to actually enter the tent. I was there with the um, with the pastor on at least one occasion, but we did not enter the tent. I have everything from drawings. Uh, I did see the, uh, the diesel powered uh, heater trailer trailer heater on the outside ducted into the tent. I did see that there was a semi permanent electrical uh, system that was uh, powered from the building. In some of the documentations, or I saw that it says the fire marshal allowed this to happen. That's not the case. I never gave permission, so I don't give permission for that. Um, electrical, a permanent electrical would go to the building department, not the fire marshal's office for that. So that um, underground electric that's uh, on a temporary type setup at or within the tent was not permitted by the fire marshal in any in any means, shape, or form. Um, in 2020. I issued a cease and desist order. Uh, I felt it was, it was necessary for me to do so because the, the church had been occupying this tent without any permission from the town, without any uh, accommodations for COVID, without any uh, variance from the state. Um, and at this point, there was a, uh, a uh, public assembly occupancy over 100 persons as per their own uh, information that they provided, the drawings they provided. Uh, no indication of a fire alarm system, which would be required in a assembly occupancy over 100 people. Uh, the egress that they showed, they showed three egresses. One of them comes out to the east side of the tent, which is in the area where the uh, side um, goes to the neighboring property. There is no egress from that point. They, might, they may have had a flap that opened, but it goes nowhere because between the tent tie downs and the fence, it's not a proper egress. So there are only two egresses. We had no uh, review to see if approximate or, or proper uh, distances between the two edges they were providing was, was acceptable. Um, exit signs, emergency lighting, all the stuff that we would want to see, even in a temporary tent, which we would could expand from the, uh, the short 10, 10 day period up to 180 days allowed by, by the state code. We don't have an application plans uh, officially submitted to our office for that review. So I did give a cease and desist order after two years of this operating and with additional information, which I think uh, spawned it at that point was we had found documentation or pamphlets that showed that they were having 
different events within the tent, which they said they sent stop uh, music, uh, persons with guitars, uh, revivals, things of this sort, not just the Sunday morning service, uh, as well as the food pantry and other things that happen out of this tent. Um, so I'm not looking to get into whether or not uh, the church is necessary for the community stuff. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure it is. Uh, houses of worship before is a wonderful thing in my, in my personal opinion, but that's not what we're here for today. We have to make sure that the life safety is, is appropriate and proper. Uh, and once it reached over 180 days, the town can no longer really issue a temporary, in my opinion, as a final launch for 30 years. This now becomes a permanent structure under the state code. Permanent structure requires many other uh, code requirements, and it would require the building department and the planning department in the town to get involved property to do this. Uh, and accommodate, I mean, anything over 180 days, the state gives a path for that, and it's a permanent intent structure. That, that's how I was looking at it as the plan. Like, um, if it's under 100 days, we can handle that over 180 days. Now we're falling into permanent, and there's reasons why the state came up with these requirements for a permanent intent structure. And you know, I don't see them happening here. Uh, so that's that's where I was at with this. Um, my last uh, time out there was probably a couple months ago. The tent is still erected. It still is on the property line. It still doesn't have the proper egress out the east side of this that they were looking for. Uh, there was still parking on the property at the time. No accommodations for stopping vehicles from accidentally hitting this tent. So a safety requirement for that. Um, and that's what I have. Thank you very much. Do we know if uh, this is still occupied on Sundays? Is it being utilized? Yes, on, on Sundays it is, and only on Sundays. Can I get something? Sure. Uh, sure. Our COVID accommodations work for an accessory to a legal and a principal occupancy. This lot is it's a vacant lot. There is no legal principal occupancy. So we wouldn't fall into the criteria to give the COVID accommodations when we have it it's party. I, I think, as I understand it, the lot next door uh, is owned by the church also and used by the church. It's not owned by the church. It's owned by a separate uh, company out of California, uh, oh. but it is used by the church. It has the name on the front of the building. It says Home Church on the front, uh, and it is immediately adjacent to the west. A small building not uh, can can never have been used as an assembly occupation. Yeah, it was expressed at the last hearing that it was for office use, office the business space, functions. Uh, yeah, I've been in that building. I did have a meeting with the pastor in there. Uh, and it's, it's set up for for use. Um, they they set it up for use. We have no <laughs> documentation on that building either, uh, as far as its use. But uh, it does have a small area where where they're usable. Uh, to be set up or something, but certainly it's, it's not currently being used as an assembly occupancy. Uh, it's more of a business occupancy. Okay. Yeah. COVID accommodations were meant for assembly occupancies to spread people out right. and distance people from each other. That's why they allowed them to put temporary structures in the store to spread people. So, Mr. Boiler, you made a statement before that I believe you did, so just bear with me for a second. That a variance would be required, a local zoning variance, if an application were to be filed, regardless if that was anywhere on that parking lot. Is that correct? Or uh, it's the extension beyond the 30 days required in chapter 30 of the fire. That's part of the fire marshal portion of the town. Okay. So I'm hearing it sounds like from the town standpoint. There's really no path for approval for this. It doesn't sound like either a temporary structure or a permanent structure. Yeah, so they're looking to extend that 180 days. It sounds to me like another year. Um, we did talk, I think I brought it up at the last hearing about since it's only on Sundays, if there was a fire watch that's documented and somebody's there when it's occupied for whatever, how many hours. But then we were really talking about the code violations. We weren't clear on you know, what this tent needed to be to get to that life safety point to allow that to even happen. So I'm struggling with that personally on um, allowing it to remain in this existing location and be utilized with all of these hurdles that need to take place and get approved for, for that to be occupied. Um, 
Does any of the other board members have any questions specifically about fire and life safety stuff or? Well, how long would uh, the process be if they were to apply to the Board of Appeals roundabout? And if they were to receive approval to have an extended period of time, and they did comply with all life safety, from what the marshal said, you would need a fire alarm system that would be install uh, proper exits, exit lighting, things like that. Would the town entertain something like that? I I can't answer for the court of appeals. I mean, they're a board; they make the decisions when they're seeking a variance. I mean, it's not good that this town has been in place for three years already. You know, I mean, temporary wheel out thirty days. They would they would we entertain just the zoning thirty days, right? Right. right. It doesn't look like it's temporary in nature. Mm -hmm. Like that was my concern is what happened for the past few years and how did it get to this point? And we didn't see any way in from the town itself. So it was a concern. I apologize for not making the last meeting. I was unaware of it. Or else it would have been very well, problem. It. But unfortunately, as you can see from just quite quite a bit of my, you know, time and effort has gone into this. And um, I said, I've been out there multiple, on multiple occasions seeing this. As a fire marshal, I'm sure you can understand when a code violation exists and it's this overextended period of time, it weighs heavily on, on the, uh, the code enforcement official, um, and it has on me for quite some time. Uh, and, uh, and I'm weighing the, uh, the use as a, as a house of worship, which I strongly agree with, house of worship, against my need to provide code, proper code enforcement and fire life safety for an occupancy over 100 persons outside. Um, you know, so many things that carbon monoxide detection and fire alarms, uh, not that's for you know, even a small church, but uh, as we consider this tent that uh, I don't know what the wind load structure was, we never got an engineer's report on the tent. Is it going to hold up with the, you know, the four inches of snow we might get in two days? You know, I, I, all the stuff that I would look at for a tent that I would be able to commit for 10 days up to a maximum of 180 days before it gets kicked over to the building department um, three years later. I don't, I don't even know the condition of this tent. Is the material still what it was when it was built three years ago? In 2020, you said there was a cease yeah. and desist order that was issued? It was in 2022, I issued a cease and desist order. Someone's issued in 2020. Are they in court? They're still in court. Okay. But they're up, they're occupied. They're still occupied. Again, a cease and desist was issued. Uh, an email came into the town from Mr. Johnson to Mr. Flood that they mentioned. Um, that I have, uh, they've included the on it. Uh, please see the email where he advises the church to meet the system to assist congregation and exercise of the first amendment. This was July 29th, 2022. Uh, as you know, the war in the six district court and the parties were determination. Uh, subsequent summons took it as noticed above, paramount to uh, harassment. Um, furthermore, the final state's operation said tenders without benefit of permit. We have required several times. In the past, for a permit, and again, we've never got an application for a permit not once in three years. Mr. Johnson, has there been any progress on finding in a permanent location, like you mentioned in December? We we did mention that in December. We are working with a realtor. Um, we have looked at one property already. Um, we we have not yet purchased a lot, so it is still our goal to move into a permanent structure in the area, but. The reason we were seeking this extension was really because we just don't have it right now. Um, if we got it tomorrow, the tent would be down today. But the, the fact of the matter is we just don't have a permanent location at, at this point. Um, I do want to state that I do find it upsetting that the fire marshal never received any of our applications as I was instructed to submit everything through the legal department and we submitted it. I mean, Crystal can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe three times in full um, directly to Ed Flood. So the fact that it never made its way to the fire marshal is at best upsetting. Um, I have no problem speaking with the fire marshal to make sure that any of his concerns are addressed because we were told to put in heat sensors. Um, we were told to put up the exit signs above the, uh, all of the flaps in, in the tent. So anytime we were told to do something, we, we did so. But I understand that Mr. Flood is no longer with the town. Um, and we've been dealing with, I believe it was um, 
Ms. Lutzer is who our attorney's been handling the, the violation with, but I, I haven't really been on that since um, new counsel was brought in. Seems to be a bunch of gaps here that I'm not quite understanding yeah. the chain of events. If you are given a cease and desist and it hasn't been reconciled yet, it should not be occupied until it is. This is all being worked out in court, in my opinion, um, till such information is received and reviewed and approved, then you shouldn't be occupying. Well, we were told by previous counsel, Mr. Flood, that the cease and desist was no longer valid once the um, ticket was issued in 2022, that everything was going to be handled through that, as we couldn't get a CO through the town, that we needed to apply for a variance with the state, and that if we received the variance through the state, the town would be satisfied. And that's what we've been trying to do since 2022. So, from the, well, the record, was there any disposition issued by the town attorney's office? On no, because it's still pending waiting this. So it keeps getting adjourned because they want to see if we get the variance. If we get the so, variance, I've been told that the ticket will be thrown out and we'll have whatever the variance issue is. As of the date of the end of the variance, if the tent is still up, that we will be issued a ticket. Right, but if you still put, if you have local zoning and an application and that you have to go through with the town, that hasn't even been done yet. So how do we even? Yes, normally it's done first. Well, the application was put in um, and we were told that we can't get a seat. The ticket, the only thing that's written on the ticket is lack of a CO. And when we tried to remedy that, we were told we can't get a CO for a temporary structure that we need to get a variance. So that's what we've been trying to do. So there's two variances. There's a zoning action with the town of Brookhaven, which you have not yet procured for setbacks. And then you're here today with us for fire code violations. Yes. And we can only weigh in on the fire code violation. We can't weigh in on the zoning. I completely so. understand. I was told that if we receive the variance from the state, we submit that with our application for the town variance. Um, but again, what that. I've been told and what the fire marshal have been told, and I have no reason not to believe him. He's been extremely forthright and uh, helpful through the past several years. But the, the fact that the information we gave to the town legal department, never making it to the fire marshal is um, disturbing. The town variance, I believe, is going to be an extension of time for its temporary structure, not necessarily setbacks. The setbacks are a question. They might not apply to us temporary structures, but the extension of time to time, the town variance that's needed. And that's what they're waiting because it needs a variance from the state first. For the setbacks. For the, and for the time extension. Yeah. Or you they, can look at it from a different perspective that the Board of Appeals could issue a condition if they're willing to give an extension of time stating pending a decision from the state Board of Review. Because what's happening here is that is a conflict <laughs> Who comes first? Uh, typically, typically, and I think we've run into this numerous times before, where the municipality won't give the, a variance or an approval until it comes from us. Right, but then if we weigh in and say yes, it's okay, does that Pending. lead the, the board of appeals of the town to say, well, the state said it's okay, so we're going to grant it? Well, little, it's know. still up to them, and they can they don't have to grant it, but it right. leaves it. Uh, we have two fire code sections cited, but the local municipality hasn't been inside to cite additional violations of the, of the fire code. Uh, of the but I don't, but let, what the marshal said, there's no formal application that was filed. Yeah. Um, my point is, how do we how do we even consider granting a variance when we only have two exterior violations cited? What about all the other violations of the building code? With a lot of conditions. Let me let me ask. Are there other code violations yeah. that what what? Would you like to see? Uh, what would you like to see in place to consider this a safe installation for getting the time frame? Well, not, not being an engineer. Uh, aside from he's looking at it now as a permanent you know, building, the fire, yeah. the fire alarms, the exit signs. Uh, I think a barrier for uh, vehicles. Um, We're looking at this as a temporary structure for it. Yes. Uh, typically, again, we require engineer certification. We have to have an engineer certification uh, prior to the ten or right after the ten being erected. That's uh, and then any tent that's extended past ten days, as per our town code, 
where the chief fire marshal does have the ability, not the requirement to, but the ability to extend the 180 days as per our local code, we require additional engineer inspections along the way to make sure the tent still maintains its structure, uh, not only snow loads, wind loads, but also tie downs proper and everything else. Um, we would have to have inspections by an independent engineer to this law office on a more frequent basis, maybe uh, every monthly or bi monthly, quarterly, you know, whatever quarterly. I'd have to talk to the chief fire marshal about that, but he has absolutely is in the past to require additional engineers and inspections at the facility uh, because it's not, a, it's not a permanent structure. Right? Yeah, no, so it's I, been up for three years. Uh, we don't know that anything that damage that ensued to this, uh, this tent over the last couple of years. Um, and we have had some pretty, pretty good storms up on, on the island. Uh, in the last two years. But apparently, it's held up through. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, will, I will. Yeah, say that it has it has been built there, and as I started the thing with it, it was a quality tent. Yeah, the tent, the tent it appeared to be close to new, if not brand new. Uh, it did have a, a claim certificate, at least on. I didn't go inside the tent, but at least on the. Actually, probably the first time I was there when there weren't any side, I probably did see a certificate from the inside. Yeah. Yes. As well as the sidewalls, which were still packaged on the ground when I was there. Um, so it needs the uh, yeah, NFP requirement to play. So, no, I un understand the need for yeah. an inspection. Uh, I've actually done those inspections uh, out of Fire Island. But uh, yeah, I agree with that. Okay. In regards to the flame resistant, that certificate was done three years ago, right? In your professional opinion, how well does the flame resistance um, maintain after being in the weather and the outside environment? Well, in the typical use of a, of a let's look at a rental tent, that's what we usually use. Uh, it's inherently flame retardant. It's going to be good forever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, unless there's restrictions put on that certificate uh, that says after washing, yeah. you know, okay. like you'd have with drapes and curtains in an assembly occupancy or something like that, uh, which does not appear to be the case here. Uh, I have to assume that the, that the material that was used is inherently flame retardant and it, it, it meets the standard. And until the, the material is no longer sound as a structure, it, it most likely will uh, meet the requirements for, for NFPA claims for it on the or flame resistance on the tent. Um, the big hurdle to me is uh, is, is fire the smoke detection in the, in the tent. I am a strong advocate for fire and smoke detection. Early warning. It's been ingrained in me since my first boss hired me back 30 years, 31 years ago. Uh, early detection to get uh, people to know something's going on. Uh, so I'm sure that would be some sort of a requirement for any extended period. We have to have some way of knowing, uh, especially with the, uh, the setback issue, both being close to the property line and another occupied building. You know, there's, there's a, a mercantile immediately adjacent to this. Uh, if that tent were to catch fire with the electrical system that's in there that, as far as I know, has never been inspected by another writer, electrical uh, inspector. Um, something, something were to happen there in this tent were to burn, the contents were to burn, how does that adversely affect the neighbor, the building next door, uh, which truthfully is on the property line. That building was built, I, I couldn't tell you when that building was built, probably early 1900s or something like that. It's been there a long time. So. I have to look at, you know, not just what's on this lot. I have to look at what's next to it. The property immediately behind it, a residential property. Yeah, could we have some issues there? Absolutely. Uh, but as I know right now, there are no structures along their property line, no sheds or anything there that would be affected by it. But we're talking about seven to 10 feet from the actual outside wall of the tent to the property line. And it's within two to three feet of that, of that much from the end of the tie downs to the, to the property line. So, Looking at the state code. Now, with the flame retardant uh, material, uh, if there is a fire in it, that is, as I understand, would not propagate through the material. It, it won't be. Uh, the, it, it wouldn't the spread. Itself would not yeah. support combustion. Right. It doesn't it doesn't mean it doesn't okay. burn. It absolutely does burn. But if you take the fire away, it puts it basically puts itself out. It doesn't propagate the fire. Yeah. Um, but if you have an active fire or what we call a room contents fire inside this uh, tent, the tent will actually absolutely burn um, until you remove the fire and then the tent will hopefully 
put itself out yeah. basically it'll, it'll slow and not it will not continue to to burn past that uh so it doesn't it's not flame proof we're not, no, we're not, no i we're not flame understand proof. that yes so it, it, is, it is still most most certainly a combustible product that has been treated with flame retards and that just does that it retards flame it doesn't stop stop flame from happening so the tent will absolutely burn in terms of uh uh detection are the heat detectors uh, adequate uh no heat detectors are considered not considered a life safety device right much too slow activation you have to have actual fire to uh to okay. set up a heat detector whereas if you have a small smoldering fire a uh, smoke detector will pick it up much quicker problem with that is that smoke detectors and even some heat detectors will not operate below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Hmm. So now we have to maintain constant heat within the tent. So that would be another requirement. We have to maintain the state code and the common code requires 40 degrees minimum temperature in, in a building that has fire protection systems within. So if we're going to put a fire protection system in this building, and, and this is this is what I've been wrestling with for three years now. When in 180 days under the state code, and I see why it was done this way, it becomes a permanent tent. Once it's a permanent tent, we're able to put a lot. A lot more requirements in there. Up to 180 days, we could be a little less uh, restricted with this, with the uh, with the code requirements according to the state you know, state code. Um, so that, that that's my concern. I would very much like to see a fire and smoke detection system in this building. How do we do that? We have to heat it. And how do we heat it? We have to put a permanent heating system in, and permanent electric system in, and, and emergency lighting with permanent wiring, and and it now becomes. From the structure, which I would then take over to the building department and we work together through the process to get us to the divide. So, this energy code concerns, this minimum plumbing facility concerns. Mm -hmm. that's well, if, if we if we granted a variance for the extension of time as a temporary tent, then it would not get into the permanent building requirements. I would have. Okay. And then we also need a well, yes. We normally don't get the town of Brookhaven filling out questionnaires and opining on these variances, but Fire Marshal Merman says he is not in support of granting on this variance. That's correct. I just wanted to put that on the record. That was the application that was submitted. Yeah. I, uh, I sat down with Chief Merman on this, and uh, we reviewed the paperwork together, and that was his. Uh, He's the signature on the bottom of that. Mm -hmm. Well, this is not an easy one. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Uh, uh, very helpful for you guys showing up today. I think yeah. um, I know how I'm going to vote. So I, um, if there's no other questions, we'll go and uh, Talk this out and come back with a decision. Anything else to add, Mr. Johnson, before we uh, deliberate? Um, the only thing I wanted to add is that there was an electrical inspection of the sub panel and that was submitted to the town legal department. Um, but was other a, than that, there was an electrical certificate. Yes. Okay. So I meant to ask that. Do you have a copy of that, Mr. Johnson? This is Courtney from your state. Uh, Ms. Miller may, uh, as as you can see from my background, um, I'm in court right now. I don't I don't have the file on me. Uh, could could forward that to um, my email address. Sure. What's your email? Uh, it's uh, Courtney C O U R T N U I dot nation and A T I O N. At B as in David, George and Oscar, S as in Sam, dot NY, dot GOV, Courtney, dot nation, at BOS, dot NY. No problem. Thank you. And I, I want to thank the board for their consideration. I just wanted to let everyone know that I'll be logging off. Ms. Miller will stay on for, uh, for the decision if you don't have any further questions for me. Just, uh, just to circle back on the occupancy again, what was the, uh, the amount of people typically you have in there on Sundays? Approximately 100 um, congregants each Sunday. And it's in use from the hours of 10 to 12. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. We'll be right back.
Thank you. Thank you. Palin back. Mm -hmm. Mr. Palin. I'm back. All right, welcome back. Okay, we're back on the record um, with respect to petition number 2023-0431, uh, Home Church, uh, Ms. Crystal Miller. The petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 3103.5, and 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 3103.8.2. The board makes the following findings. Number one, the subject tent structure is approximately 1,800 square feet in area of type 2B construction classification and A2 occupancy classification. It is located in the southeast corner of the lot, about seven feet from a one-story building with masonry exterior walls on the adjacent lot and approximately seven feet from the lot lines to the east and south. Number two, there do not appear to be any buildings within 20 feet of the south property line. Number three, the tent contains chairs laid out facing a lectern and has a wide central aisle, and the petitioner has stated in testimony that the Sunday occupant load is approximately 100 persons. If the seating arrangement in the petitioner's submission is accurate, up to 134 persons should, could occupy the tent. Number four, the tent has exit flaps on three sides. However, on the east side, proximity to the property lines and abutting building prevent proper exit discharge to legal open space. The tent contains no side swinging exit doors if the side flaps of the tent are down. Number five, the maximum time allowed for a temporary membrane structure per section 3103.5 of the Fire Code of New York State is 180 days. The petitioner has occupied the subject membrane structure since 2020. The maximum 180 days expired in June 2021. The petitioner wishes to permit the tent to be in place for approximately another year from this hearing date. Number six, the town of Brookhaven Fire Marshal has stated in testimony that a cease and desist order was issued in 2022. The petitioner has stated in testimony that the tent is still being occupied every Sunday in violation of this, of this cease and desist. Number seven, the Town of Brookhaven Fire Marshal has stated in testimony that there were no formal applications submitted to the Fire Prevention Division for this temporary tent, which has existed since 2020 and has not had the opportunity to conduct proper inspections of the interior of the tent. Number eight, in addition, testimony from the Billing Department representative had stated that a local zoning variance may also be required. Number nine, the Board is concerned that there are many life safety requirements in the Fire Code of New York State that have not been met. Sufficient evidence has not been submitted to this board to demonstrate compliance with all the applicable life safety code requirements. And number 10, the chief fire marshal of the town of Brookhaven has indicated that he is not in favor of the granting of this application. So with respect to 19 NYCRR part 1225, the 2020 fire code of New York state section 3103.5 and 19 NYCRR part 1225, the 2020 fire code of New York state section 3103.8.2, the board finds that the granting of this variance would substantially and adversely affect the uniform code's provisions for health, safety, and security. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for a variance from provisions of 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 3103.5, and 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 3103.8.2, be and is hereby proposed to be denied. I need a motion to deny. So moved. May I get a second? Second. Mr. Bavone, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Palin, aye. Aye. A motion is not approved. Furthermore, it should be noted that the decision of this board is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specification presented in support of this application. So, did you get that, Ms. Miller? We denied your application. Yep. Um, I would I would think if you got your uh, your package together to the town of Brookhaven and they uh, and they did a proper review and pulled together all the uh, violations that need to be addressed, you know, possibly you can come back. But uh, based on what you submitted today and December, we cannot grant the variance. Thank you. It's just too much. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you. That concludes the hearing. Okay. We we have uh, Mr. Vito. Amy DeVito. Good morning. Hi, are you there? Yep. Hi. How are you? Hey. Good morning. How are you? Um, I'm good. Okay. Good here, everyone. We're going to uh, read your case into the record, and then we'll give you the mic. Okay. Okay. The second hearing is in the matter of petition number twenty twenty three zero four eight two. Petitioner is Amy DeVito. The agreed party is Karen Manoia. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> okay. This petition pertains to a variance for an existing detached dwelling, construction type 5B, 26 feet in height, one story above a basement, and approximately 1,972 square feet in total floor area, including the basement areas located at 47 Wellington Road, I believe that's Middle Islands, town of Brookhaven, County of Suffolk, state of New York. Petitioner is seeking relief from 19. Uh oh. Yeah. Um, let me call them, get them back on. Yeah. It starts reading. Right, it's not much. I'll just read the, the back into the record. When you tell me when we're good. Um, Bail as Bail in to. Turn on his video. Mr. Palin, you need to be seen. We can see him. Now we can. Okay. Oh, you can. But everybody else can. Are we recording? Yes. Okay. Let's try again. Petition number 2023-0482. Petition pertains to a variance for an existing detached dwelling, construction type 5B, 26 feet in height, one story above basement, approximately 1,972 square feet in total floor area, including basements including basement areas located at 47 Wellington Road, Middle Island, Town of Brookhaven, County of Suffolk, State of New York. Petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1220, the 2020 Residential Code of New York State, Section AJ 601.3, Exception 1, which states, space created in basements may have a ceiling that projects to within 6 feet 8 inches of the finished floor, and beams, girders, and ducts in such space or other obstructions may project within 6 feet 4 inches of the finished floor. Existing finished ceiling heights and spaces in basements shall not be reduced. The petitioner is seeking relief or seeking a variance to allow ceiling heights in the basement that are less than allowed. Okay, Ms. DeVito, you're up. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, so we are in the process of legalizing the converted basement. Um, I was not the uh, permit expediter that originally handled the submission to the town, but I was then hired to handle the New York State variance portion of the process. Uh, what, what I do know of the background is that um, a violation was issued for the converted basement uh, to Ms. Manoia, and she has been working on, uh, I'm sorry? Uh, you need, I think you need to start again. You. Yeah, we lost. You. Yeah, we heard you had you were hired to uh, handle a state variance and then yeah. you froze. <laughs> um, so, so basically, um, what I do know of the history of this uh, particular um, case is that uh, the, uh, the homeowner, Miss Manoia, her expediter uh, applied to uh, for a permit to uh, legalize the converted basement. By the way, I just want to say I'm just recovering from COVID and I have COVID brains. So <laughs> I'm trying very hard to articulate, but I, I'm, I'm extremely foggy. No, just take your time. You're fine. Take your time. Okay. So um, it, they applied for a permit for the uh, converted basement. And as a result of uh, reviewing the um, plans and, and I believe an inspection occurred at the property with uh, Inspector Dennis Phelps, it was discovered that uh, some state variances would be required, which is where I stepped in. So basically what we're looking at is, um, I believe that most of the variances we're requesting are relatively routine, except for the uh, steam pipe that goes across the main area of the basement from the boiler room to the stairs, the interior access stairs. Uh, just a little information about the steam system. So the house was built. Um, there's conflicting information on records, but it looks like it was built somewhere between 1930 and 1945. Um, 
the the so that obviously means that you know construction was a bit different back then as far as ceiling height and uh, and you know girders and things like that this particular house was built with a uh, steam pipe system for heating um we did have a uh, company uh, by name of perillo bros come in to basically analyze that particular length of pipe to figure out if there was any way to recess it into the ceiling or uh, modify it at all so that we can make the height higher. Uh, they came back with a letter to us, which I did uh, email over to Lola this morning, but I will read it into the record uh, again. Perillo Bros. Uh, we have it. Yeah, okay, good. Have it. So basically what he's saying is um, that in order to maintain the integrity of the system, it can't be modified because as a steam system, it does rely on a, a very, I guess, exact pitch to work properly. So we, we did explore that. That wasn't an option. Um, the ceiling itself, as you can see in the photos, it's actually um, a system of uh, beams and then sheetrocked ceiling. So it actually is sheetrocked. It's not a drop ceiling. So there is no way to raise the ceiling. Um, I, and I, I just want to point out, while I know it obviously still requires a variance because it is 5.8, it is just a steam pipe. Uh, it is not enclosed at all. Um, you know, very easy to get past, uh, and we're, we're, you know, happy to answer any questions the board may have. And of course, uh, open to any suggestions the board may have. Do you have a cost on how much it would take how much it would cost to move that pipe up or is it just not feasible altogether? It's just is it going to compromise together? Yeah, we did explore that and he he, he didn't uh, the gentleman from Perillo Bros didn't even feel compelled to put a quote together because he said it's just simply not feasible um, th that they would not be able to obtain the pitch needed in order to keep the system working. The system is also close to 90 years old. So um, as far as the piping, so they're they they're very hesitant to modify it at all. Yeah, because it looks Rob, we're having but, problems like, hearing you. Rob, we're ha having problems hearing Probably you. Probably four to six inches above the pump. Rob. I, We're having problems hearing you. I think you have to start again. The, the ceiling um, that potentially could be moved up, but you're saying it needs a pitch. Rob? We're having I'm difficulties again. Hearing me? Yes. What's going on today? Hey, court. I mean, I'm not I don't know if you guys could hear me, but I am not able to understand uh, what you're communicating at all. Right. Um, oh. I'm sorry, Amy. Okay. I'm trying to, okay. uh, sp I'm speaking to Courtney right now. We're okay. going to have to probably suspend for about a half an hour so that we can uh, get this internet um, fixed. Okay? okay. So we're yeah. going to pause this. All right. Okay. Thank you. I have no idea where we left off. I think we were talking about the Perillo brothers letter. Yes. And then I had asked about the cost to raise the steam pipe, and then we were talking about the pipe. So yeah. where feel we free left to off, embellish. Where I last heard you, uh, we you were asking me if it was feasible to even move it, and I was explaining that. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Jacovina, who owns, I guess, Brola Brothers, uh, was saying that it's he didn't even bother giving us a cost estimate to do it because he just wouldn't recommend it. Um, <clears throat> being that the system is so old and 
it needs a very precise pitch to work uh, because it is a steam system. Um, so after I had said that, you, I believe you were asking some questions. I didn't hear anything you said. <laughs> no problem. We could back up to that and speak on, yeah. on, on that it's, issue. Um, the pipe is covered in the, it uh, looks like in the photos, that's that black covering. Yes. <clears throat> uh, I assume that's over insulation. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, it looks like it's wrapped. Um, I, I think that's actually insulation tape. Um, I don't know if there's anything in between. There's no real okay. area on the pipe to see anything between the pipe and the, the black wrapping. Right. I mean, it could, there could be asbestos there if it's 1930 house. That's true. Um, I, I had a question on the actual pipe that services the upstairs. Because it yeah. doesn't look like that's the way the basement is heated. There's some photos on the baseboard that looks like it has just regular PIX tubing. Or is it that steam piping heat the basement too? I think Do we know? The entire house. So if you look at the photos, you see the black wrapped pipe and then there's a pipe above it um, that's white in color also wrapped. I believe that that is also steam pipe. Because if you, if you look at the picture where you specifically see the washer and the dryer, you could see that... Yeah. I think also ties into then the black wrapped pipe. So okay. I believe the entire home is uh, fitted by steam for heat. Um, I, I don't know otherwise. I mean, we're just going off of these photos that were submitted. I mean, if you look at the pantry, it looks like yeah. there's a little baseboard unit with these little pipes running to it. It just looks like, a, I don't know if that's electric. Maybe. That could be electric. It, yeah, it may be just an electric system for additional heating down there. Um, but the bottom line, you know, it's steam, it's a heavy lift to take it out or alter it. Right. Um, no cost provided. Um, the ceiling heights are at 6'4"? Yes. Is that to these little timber beams or is that to the drywall? I think they use the height from the timber beams because the, from what I understand in speaking with the draftsman and then architect, uh, they they were basically using an, an, what the average ceiling height would be, and they were utilizing the beams as the actual. Those, those look like trim, Amy. They look like trim boards. I don't think they're really structural beams, are they? Um, because it like picture frames the the basement. They go horizontal, vertical. I'm not in both directions. Yeah, I don't see any detail about the structure. The structure for these, I. I don't know, it would just be odd to me that they would, a house so old would have these as just a decorative feature. Okay, so you're saying six foot four is to the lowest projection. I believe so, yes. Ceiling height projection. Mm -hmm. And then we have a door opening from the um, so-called bar area. Yes. And to go from the bar area to the, uh, I'm trying to pull up the plan here. The bar area to the laundry room, there's a six foot, head height issue there. That's correct. Okay. Who did the drawings? Uh, the drawings were done by Andrew Graham, uh, and then they were reviewed and signed by Robert Higgins, architect. Has uh, Robert Higgins been to the house? I, I, I'm not sure. Um, and the only reason why I'm not sure is because these plans were prepared for the permit application prior to my involvement. So I, I just, I couldn't answer that question, yes or no. Yeah, I'm asking because they're not really proper, uh, don't have proper title block and uh, information on them for a good architectural drum. Right, well, like I said, I do know that originally this started out as just a drafted plan by Andrew Graham. Um, Andrew then- uh, Andrew's a PE though, isn't he? No, Andrew Graham, uh, he currently works for the town of Brookhaven, actually. So what happened was, mm -hmm. was not a, working for the town of Brookhaven, drafted the plans and was uh, working on the file <clears throat> along with the expediter. Then he uh, became uh, employed at the town of Brookhaven, so was no longer able to obviously submit applications to the town of Brookhaven, at which point Bob Higgins stepped in 
to handle the plans. So that's why the, these aren't like your usual looking architectural plans. Gotcha. All right. Um, I mean, I, I personally don't have an issue with the 6-4. I think this 5-8 is really low. Is there a way to mitigate some of that uh, potential collision with your head? Um, I mean, they could, I'm sure they could, you know, find a, a paint that could adhere to um, the black covering or maybe even remove the black covering, well, wrap it with something brighter. Um, or you can use a foam insulation, maybe? It, yes, that would be a possibility, too. I, I think yeah. that would definitely be a way for them to make sure that that drop stands out for somebody, you know, passing through. Um, I mean, as so, you see in that particular area, it's really just the laundry and storage area. Obviously, there's no, you know, sleeping or even recreating in that area. Uh, so it, it is just to access that area of storage and laundry. All right. So the first floor, they come down that main stair and they turn into that laundry room area. Correct. And then the door to the right goes into the rest of the basement. I mean, would your client be amenable to putting a wall under the pipe or just having an opening into the laundry room? Because then you're really just navigating a a door opening to get to the laundry room and not having uh, the ability to hit your head on a uh, I mean, it seems to me, I don't know. I, is it the same difference is, though? Then it's just going to be a low door opening. Yeah, we've done that before where we have beams or girders that bifurcate a basement space and just to minimize the potential to hit your head on a long beam, mm -hmm. that you create these openings that direct the traffic and you have the ability to just know that you're going through a door opening sort of like the six foot doors the same way right no under you know you're not you're not getting that pipe up to six feet and which required this application to be filed uh, i'm sorry say that one more time what required this application to be filed with the building department which then got referred to us because it appears that it was a very old existing condition what precipitated yeah. today? I I don't know. I don't know the uh, exact story on how this occurred, but they received a violation from the town of Brookhaven, a ticket, a court appearance ticket for a converted basement without permits. I don't know what prompted that violation to or even have the town look into uh, the property at all. But what I do know is that a ticket was written. Uh, which then prompted them to go to court and then, of course, file the requisite building permits, which then led us to you. So did that violation state by any means that there was an illegal occupancy in the basement? The, the, the cellar area? I have a copy of the ticket and it, it just says basement conversion. Conversion to what? Habitable space? It, uh, it literally just yeah. says basement conversion. Okay. They're, they're, they're pretty nondescript on the tickets usually. Um, so I'm looking at the ticket now. It is, um, it, it just for the record, it's taken what ticket 183586, uh, written by Frank Brignola, and it just states the offense is basement conversion. So that was it. And did the Perillo brothers or that company that was doing the plumbing letter or at Issued the plumbing letter. Did they give you any other information about whether or not they can convert the steam system to a regular system? And uh, have oh, pipes move? We didn't. We didn't inquire about changing the heating system. Um, it's just not something that was really on on the table as far as my my client was uh, concerned because obviously that would be a, a pretty. I would imagine a pretty serious expense to convert the entire system in the house. Um, we are also dealing with, again, a house that is uh, somewhere around 90 years old, so uh, they don't necessarily want to tear it apart. Uh, my client purchased the house, or at least came into title around 2008. I believe this basement was finished well before that, just based on the finishings that I see um, with the paneling and the, uh, you know, kind of decor down there, if you will, um, it, it appears to me that it was probably finished many decades ago. So this has been a yeah. for quite some time. Well, on your application, you're creating, uh, it would create an excessive and unreasonable economic burden. So usually you'd like to know yeah. uh, costs to mitigate. So um, we could uh, get uh, an estimate from Perillo Bros to um, 
to propose a, the conversion of of the you know system from scheme to another means. I, I could most certainly procure that and, and submit that if if the board would be interested in waiting for that and then adjourning the case. Did the plan examiner comment on any other sections of the code or the other spaces that appear to be segregated from the main area that additional means of egress would be required? So um, I have the uh, review here from when the original permit was submitted uh, by the you know other expediter that I had uh, mentioned previously, um, and it is stating that the uh, the height under the girder is six feet, which is four inches too low. The height under the pipe is uh, eight inches below minimum required code of six four. Uh, ceiling height throughout the basement is four inches below the minimum code. Um, and that is that is all that was uh, commented on as far as this particular review. Okay. Yeah, so, so um, and just to answer your question a little further, <clears throat> there's the outside cellar entrance and then the interior access to the house. Um, the media room is, is opened up. Um, and then we are proposing to remove the door between the laundry and the storage area just for purposes of the doors just really not needed. That way it could be a bit more free flowing down there um, as far as accessing egress. Yeah, also it's, it's set up where these could be bedrooms. So I understand the code official wanting to take the door off. You could yeah. maybe remove the closets with inside the storage spaces because why would you have a storage closet inside a storage room? Yeah, I'm sure they would. Stuff, like, stuff like that, yeah. Um, other potential code violations. I know we were looking at the photos before, like the stair going down to the basement doesn't have guards on it. Stuff like that. They're going to have to address. Yep. To demonstrate code compliance. Um, the lights are flush with the ceiling. Correct. Uh, let me just take. A There's look. no projecting lights. No, not, not that I, not that I, uh, have seen okay. while I'm there or I see in the photos. Okay, and it's an oil fired boiler. Mm -hmm. What's what's the construction of the walls around the boiler room? Could um, they be one hour? They they're definitely sheetrock. I don't know if they're five eighths fire rated. Um, that is something that would obviously be um, addressed prior to inspection with the town inspector, so that. We can make sure that it it passes. So, uh, well, I mean, it, it it typically is not required. Usually, we ask for it when in granting variances uh, as a safety measure. And then the bifold doors don't comply with any kind of opening protective. So, if we did, if there was a path to approval of this variance, it, there would be a condition where the boiler room would be enclosed in fire rated construction with uh, commensurate opening protectors, which the doors would have to be changed and the enclosure would have to be upgraded. Yeah, that would be uh, I, I know that the town definitely enforces any uh, walls within 18 inches of the actual mechanicals. Um, so at the very least, we would have been doing that anyway. And of course, we combustible recommendations that you guys have. Uh, and then the fire rated door. Um, well, I don't have the final approved plans from the town for the permit because we haven't gotten there yet. I imagine that that is something that they're going to enforce as well because they do enforce that over there. Okay. What about the door on the top of the stairs that leads outside that opens up over the stair? Yeah, that's a tough fix. What the door on top of the stairs to get into the house? On the first level going down the stairs. Yeah. It appears that there's a door that opens up over the stairs. Or is that just a panel? A what panel is that? Is that a door? No, it's this it's an exhibit B. So it's on the first floor plan. You're looking at the door next to the stove that leads to the landing to go down. There's a, it looks like a storm door in the back and then a white ex exterior door. Mm -hmm. That's not a door. What is that? I don't know. It's like a paneled wall. See the door here. There's the door from the door kitchen on the first floor. Yeah. And then there's the door to the outside. There's no door. Yeah. That's a door. That's a door. That looks like a door. Yeah. Yeah. So Amy, what photo is that? Amy, exhibit B? Yeah, exhibit B, interior yeah. stairs. Uh-huh. Oh, the left of the door. That's just the open, that's just the open main door. So that door up there that's is just like that's 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 that. Say that again. The door uh -oh. 
so you see the storm door with the the black latch correct yep okay the door that is opposite it is actually the door that closes that door that's a, that's a white door the one that's against the wall that's a storm door what about the door what about when you're walking up the steps there's yeah. looks like a panel door is that a door that swings over the steps no that yeah. i think that's wall paneling stone door that's the main door but this white door that you're looking at no i'm not worried about the white door or the storm door it's the paneling this no, one. not your ex exhibit B. This oh, wow. Okay. Now the next page. Yes. I, I... Here's the door here. One at a time, please. One at a time. Here's the door that covers that. The storm door. This, I don't think, is the thing. Show them. You know, I have to be honest with you. Can I, you see that? I, I, this I, thing right here. I see it. The exhibit Mr. B Bavone is up the steps, and then to the left, it appears that there's a door that swings over the step. Is that a door? I, no, I don't think that's a door. I think that's paneling. That's wall paneling. I believe. Look at the, look at the floor plan. On Another the first time, floor. please. Yeah. So on the floor plan, the door swings the other way. Mr. Bavone is saying on the photo exhibit B, that panel door looks like it's swinging over the steps, which should not. No. Okay. It's, it's, see, there's this here's the here's the floor, the outside door for the yeah. So this is not this is not a door. That's the door. How do I get that the outside door to that? How we love these photos. Okay, so there's there's usually any any other code violations that need to be addressed by the building department. Um yeah. I understand so, what you're speaking of. Um I, I I believe it actually is just a piece of wall paneling, if that is in fact the door, which I can't recall. I, I don't it wasn't closed if it is a door when I was there. So if okay. it, if it is in fact a door, that would be removed. We would be removing that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry for the confusion. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? No. 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 Um, and definitely no cooking or sleeping down here. That would be something that would be probably on the CO that's issue. Yeah, they're they're uh, they're going to be very specific about how they word the permit and the CO for this file because of the violation. So they'll no sleeping or cooking in the basement. Okay. Um, if there's no other questions by the board members, we're going to deliberate and we'll be back as okay. quick as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, don't go anywhere. Mr. Palin, can you hear us? I'm with can we you can guys. see you? All right, we're ready to rock and roll. Mr. Vito, you with us? I'm here. All right, get your notebook out. Okay, got it. Okay. Back on the record, with respect to petition number 2023 0482, uh, Karen Manoia or Manoa. Petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR Part 1220, the 2020 Residential Code of New York State, Section AJ 601.3, Exception 1. The board makes the following findings. Number one, the dwelling that is the subject of this determination has a basement that is finished. Number two, the basement layout in drawing shows a media room, bathroom, bar room, boiler room, a pantry, and a laundry room. Number three, there are no provisions for sleeping or cooking in the submitted drawings. Number four, the basement, I'm sorry, the finished basement ceiling is six foot four with two projections, a girder that is six feet where six foot four is required and pipes that are a minimum of five foot eight where six foot is required. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Read over um, planning number three, please. Um, because it's the basement specifically. Oh, I said submitted drawings, the submitted basement drawings. Yes. So number three is there are no provisions for sleeping or cooking in the submitted basement drawings. Correct. Number four, the finished okay. basement ceiling is six foot four. Sorry for the interruption. Mr. Chairman, is the Miss Amy DeVito with us? Yes. yes. I, I, can yep. see, I cannot see his, her face. Here. It might be off the computer. Sir. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. Oh, I forgot that. No worries. Yeah. Legally, she has to see you. You don't have to see her. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 
Number four, the finished basement ceiling is six foot four with two projections that girded at six feet where six foot four is required and pipes that are at a minimum of five foot eight inches where six foot four is required. Number five, the finished ceiling height in the six foot four section does not satisfy the six foot eight allowances of AJ 601.3 of the 2020 Residential Code of New York State. Number six, painting or wrapping these projections in the color that contrast to that of the ceiling will call attention to the obstruction and alert persons to avoid the low headroom condition. Number seven, a below grade door exists um, for emergency use in the basement to supply a second way out. Number eight, installing electrically wired smoke alarms within the basement connected to similar devices located on the main level of the building would if maintained properly provide warning to persons using the basement in advance of a smoke related emergency. And number nine, a carbon monoxide detector is required at this level due to the presence of a boiler in the basement. So with respect to section AJ 601.3 exception one, the board finds strict compliance with the provisions to the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code would entail practical difficulties or necessary hardship and would create an excessive and unreasonable economic burden and would be physically or legally impractical. And the granting of this variance will not substantially adversely affect the Uniform Code's provisions for health, safety, and security. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for variance from the provisions of section AJ 601.3, exception one, being is hereby proposed to be granted with the following conditions. Excuse me. Number one, that electrically wired smoke alarms shall be installed and maintained throughout the basement in accordance with section R314 of the 2020 Residential Code of New York State and connected to similar devices located throughout the main level of the dwelling. Number two, that an emergency escape and rescue opening shall be maintained at the basement level. Number three, that the basement shall not be used for cooking or sleeping. This shall be stated on the certificate of occupancy that is issued by the authority having jurisdiction in this matter. Number four, that the steam pipe at the five foot eight projection in the basement shall be appropriately encapsulated, marked or treated with a contrasting color to highlight the low headroom with cushioning permanently affixed to the low edges. Is that cohesive? Yeah. Okay. Number five, that any other projection at or below six feet shall be treated with contrasting color or and or padding. Number six, that all ceiling mounted lighting in the basement shall be recessed flush with the ceiling plane. And number seven, that the basement and its stairway shall conform to all other applicable, applicable requirements of the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code, including but not limited to the requirements for carbon monoxide detection and handrails. So I need a motion to approve with these conditions. So moved. May I get a second? Second. Mr. Bavone, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hey, Lynn, aye. aye. Motion is approved. Motion is approved. Furthermore, it should be noted that the decision of this board is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans or specification presented in support of this application. So we had those conditions. Any questions? No questions. Thank you, everybody. And uh, okay. we will uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Good job today. Bye. Uh, Bye. Yes. Um, just just ask to remind you um, to make the presenters introduce themselves. Got it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sorry, I can't stay. Well, nice to see you. Yeah, I know. It's nice. I'm gonna get upstairs. Be safe tomorrow. Yeah, I gotta get my jacket. Yeah, I will. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She looks like she's having fun. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Take care. Thank you. All right. Who do we have for the last hearing? Anthony Egan, PE? Yes. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. How about yourself? Good, thank you. Do we have a hard stop that we should be aware of? Um, I can accommodate the board schedule. Uh, the Great. district uh, superintendent and staff may hop off because of that hard stop, but I can accommodate the board schedule. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, are we on the record? Okay, third and final hearing is in the matter of petition number 2023-0464. The petitioner is Mr. Anthony Egan, PE for the Albertson Water District. This petition pertains to the installation of a diesel generator. Oh, boy. 
excuse me for a moment. I just screwed up my computer. Okay, uh, this petition pertains to the installation of a diesel generator sub base fuel storage tank that is accessory to a building of Group U pumping facility occupancy. The buildings on the parcel will be of type two and type three construction, a maximum of two stories high. These buildings will each be under 3,000 square feet in total gross floor area and located at 57 Stratford South. Is that Rosalind Heights? I think it's Rosalind Heights, town of North Hempstead, state of New York. Petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, section 5704.2.9.6.1.1 which states that above ground tanks operating at pressures not exceeding 2.5 PSIG for storage of class one, two, or three A liquids, which are designed with a floating roof, a weak roof to shell seam or equipped with emergency venting devices, limiting pressure to 2.5 PSIG, shall be located in accordance with table 22.4.1.1A of the NFPA 30. The petitioner requests the location of a tank at a distance less than allowed by Table 22.4.1.1a of the NPA 30-18. Okay, that was a mouthful. <laughs> okay, Mr. Egan, please uh, state your name, address, and uh, tell us what's going on. Uh, my name is Anthony Egan. I'm the project manager for this project with uh, Diverka and Bartolucci consulting engineers uh, for the Albertson Water District located at 184 Shepherd Lane in Roslyn Heights, New York. Uh, the Albertson Water District is seeking a, a variance for the proximity of the fuel storage tank under a, a, a standby generator uh, providing power to the site uh, in the event of a primary power outage. The Albertson Water District at great expense has programmed, planned, and undertaken this project to implement the, the granular activated carbon treatment at this site for the removal of PFOA and PFOS from the raw waters withdrawn from the aquifer. Uh, as part of this project and complying with the uh, water re quality requirements set forth by the Department of Health, the district uh, has extreme sensitivity to its neighbors and wanted to maintain the residential character of the site. And uh, notwithstanding any of the other expenditures on the project, one of the most uh, costly is the maintenance of the residential character of the site, the improvements on the site, uh, with the neighborhood. Uh, the property uh, immediately to the north is a Nassau County uh, sewer drainage basin for infiltration of stormwater, and the property to the east is a Nassau County sewer pump station, and this is a corner lot, approximately a half an acre, uh, with uh, road frontages on the south and west side. The location of the generator is between the pre-existing building on the site and the Nassau County sewer pump station. Um, locating the generator in this area uh, is the furthest away from a potable water supply well on the property that could be accommodated uh, while the construction of the new building for the granular activated carbon filters is located in the uh, rear corner of the lot. Um, Albertson Water District being a separate commissioner elected uh, water district uh, formulated under Article 13 of town law is not necessarily subject to the area requirements of the town of North Hempstead Code as adopted in the town of North Hempstead Code for side yard and front yard setbacks. With that, the Albertson Water District submitted plans to the Nassau County Department of Health uh, on multiple occasions in which the location of the generator was not objected to. Um, when the application for the diesel fuel tank was submitted to the health department, uh, the health department came back and asked for uh, compliance with NFPA 30 in 
the application made by the expediter in this case for the tank. In accommodating the health department's request, uh, the district located the tank seven and a half feet away from the property line. And uh, after receiving word that the health department does not support the variance, and in discussions with the health department, um, came to an understanding that the health department wouldn't support the variance unless a firewall was installed between the fuel tank and the property line. The Albertson Water District has agreed to install a uh, eight inch CMU core filled uh, retaining wall between the tank and the property line, which extends 30 inches above the tank, 30 inches in each direction in the length of the tank, thus protecting the adjoining Nassau County sewer pump station property uh, from an event of a, a, a tank catastrophe. In evaluating the locations uh, for this generator on the site, there's little alternative uh, other than the location proposed. Um, not only would uh, alternate location place the generator closer to a water supply well, it would also uh, place the generator closer to residential properties in the neighborhood, thus increasing the level of noise during its use. We acknowledge for this installation that uh, there are several conflicting regulations um, in the site constraints with area setbacks, code required setbacks, uh, setbacks from the water supply well, uh, setbacks from buried utilities. And we believe, uh, DMB and the district believes that the proposed location of the generator is the best most appropriate location on the site for the generator while maintaining public health and as implicated in and as implemented and proposed would pose the least risk to public health if implemented in its current proposed location. The tank is to be installed in accordance with all petroleum bulk storage requirements uh, as required by the Nassau County Health Department as de as uh, uh, delegated that review authority by the DEC. Uh, we've received word from the expediter that the Nassau County Health Department is ready to approve the submitted application for a permit for the tank with the granting of a variance by this board. Um, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, and that uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Egan. Uh, let me, I'll start. Uh, do you know what the uh, direction of groundwater flow is here? Uh, this area of the county is, uh, uh, well, this area of Long Island is relatively difficult to discern. But generally, in in this area, it's um, it's um, northwest, I believe. Low in the northwest. Mm -hmm. Let me confirm that. Like going on in the site. I'm sorry, south southwest in this in this location south. is the groundwater flow. South southwest, so that if the Correct. tank was located in the southwest corner uh, of the property, any spill from the tank that did get into groundwater, so when there was a spill uh would migrate away from the well correct 
So was that area considered? That area was considered for a location of the generator. Placing the generator in that location and is very prominent on the site. Um, notwithstanding that, it might um, conflict with site distances for um, the ability of uh, traffic turning into and out of uh, Stephen Lane, which is that road right there. Um, it's also placing the generator closer to the water supply well. And uh, that area on the site uh, has kind of been reserved for uh, potential AOP treatment on the site should it be needed, which is the advanced oxidation treatment for the removal of 1,4-dioxane should it show up in the raw waters in this well. What is, is there, uh, you mentioned before that there was, uh, this complies with uh regulations in terms of distance from the well uh what is that distance is the the new york state sorry is the new york for distance yeah the Go new ahead. york state department of health requires uh maintenance of a 100 foot wellhead protection easement and a 200 foot control the 200 foot radius is not existent in this location. However, um, the the well has existed there since um, the the 40s, I believe. Okay, so where you are is right close to the 100 foot, right? Really, right at the 100 foot. Okay. Yeah, one of the figure one shows the 100 foot radius. Um, gotcha. And the location of the tank in the hundred foot radius. It's it's border. It's on the edge of it. It's as far away from the well as feasible, practical on the site. Right. Okay. We just want to read something into the record to make sure that your proposal is complying with his request. So, in the application, there's a requirement for a code enforcement official uh, questionnaire, and Mr. Robert Weitzman had stated that. Um, he recommends that a two hour fire resisted rated wall within without any openings extending not less than 30 inches above and to the sides of the 3,244 gallon diesel tank to be installed or an underground double wall fiberglass tank be installed instead of the proposed above ground tank. So I think you mentioned in your presentation that you were proposing to put those 30 inch, eight inch masonry walls up. And yes. that's what he's asking yes, for that is, is attainable. That's what you're proposing. Yes, yes, that is shown on our drawing S9. Okay, okay. I just wanted to make sure that. What's that, Mr. Courtney? Um, are we putting in both the double wall, a tank, and the blast wall? Yes. Yes. Um, on your figure drawing um, S9. It shows 36 inches above the top of the tank. Is that uh, inches. Is it 30 or 36? Is it supposed to be? Will it be uh, on, on the drawing S9, uh, it would be 36 inches, yes. The the firewall would be 30 inches with the coping stone on top, 36. I see. On your drawing C3, you propose a setback of, it looks like it's, there's a line in front of about seven feet from the property line to the, from the fuel tank where the fuel tank would start. If your other three feet or so, or four feet, looks like your stairway and your platform to get into the generator. Correct. And then on, on your minimum distance table, two, two, dot four dot one um you're saying that you need to be 15 feet away from the property line is that correct the table in the code does say 15 feet yes so what prohibits you from not moving that generator to the west 
Closer to the building. Closer to the building, not to the north, but to the west. Uh, the water main that's there on the site. Uh, the the uh, Robert Weitzman and the Nassau County Health Department um, have asked for a uh, ten foot separation between the water main and the diesel fuel tank, and they have actually asked us to push the tank uh, closer to the property line. Um, and we have said, due to conventional construction means, being able to construct a, a CMU wall uh, and not impact the adjoining property or be able to excavate for the foundations um, in close proximity to the property line without encroaching on the adjacent property would be uh, uh, nearly impossible. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Can you just uh, discuss any potential fuel alternatives that have been investigated other than the diesel? Has sure. Been looked into? Okay. Sure. Um, we uh, looked at natural nat natural gas uh, for this site, um, and uh, during Superstorm Sandy, uh, as as many people may be uh, recalling, uh, some of the gas mains were impacted and gas was not flowing, um, and the the district did not want to have uh, an extended outage because this is the the well they. Uh, primarily used to serve this area of the district. They wanted to make sure that it would be able to uh, operate continuously. So um, we did reach out to National Grid and National Grid uh, on had replied that uh, on another project, we would need to implement over $700,000 worth of improvements in National Grid's infrastructure including upsizing a main in um, an alternate location um, to provide gas toward this area of the district. Anybody is, uh, look at not having a belly tank and just putting a tank in a different location on a property, leaving the generator away from the water line? Um, we did consider that. Uh, the issue with that is now you have fuel lines, which are subject to damage or potential leaks, which would in and of themselves create a potential for uh, uh, spills or uh, any uh, future contamination based on uh, just the use uh, of the generator. Thank you. And no other fuel sources, like I don't think battery would make sense, but I know they have storage buildings now with battery backup. Yeah. I don't know the long term. No, you still no. need a proper fuel for a generator. You really for a long term need. running backup power. Yeah, it's usually just uh, a few days. You're of talking uh, diesel, gas, or propane. Okay. Yeah, the the costs for a propane generator of this size were were cost prohibitive. Not to mention, I'd rather see diesel stored than propane stored. <laughs> okay. Um, County Fire Marshal, have they reviewed the application? Uh, they have not reviewed it. My understanding is they do not have jurisdiction. It was relieved back to the uh, health department. Okay. So there's no comments or approval or endorsements from the County of uh, Fire Marshal? No, health department jurisdiction. Okay. The the health, town of North Hempstead. Sorry. I was going to say the health department is usually very uh, strict in terms of all the safety features uh, required by NFPA and the code. Yeah, I think yeah, I read somewhere included in. There's a a, a dual containment uh, belly tank with uh, spill leak and level detection. Um, there is a fill box on the fill port to contain any spills during filling. Um, there is uh, an emergency vent and uh, a, a regular vent should the tank ever be uh, overfilled. Um, for the record, the town of North Hempstead Building Department has reviewed the plans for this and has issued a oil permit for 
this tank and for this project. What well, what was the uh, the water authority doing for emergency power here before? Uh, there's uh, a, there was an existing natural gas fire generator uh, in the facility. That was uh, too small for the uh, new facility. Correct. Or? Correct. Because of the granular activated carbon system, um, right. the motors on the pumps needed to be upsized, making the existing generator too small. Gotcha. Any other questions? Is there something that we didn't touch on, Mr. Courtney? We know it. Okay. So it's seven to eight feet and we need 15. Correct. And the mitigating factors there, you're going to put this eight inch CMU wall, which is essentially two hour fire rated. Correct. Uh, minimum 30 inches above the tank. Correct. Which sides would that be on? Just, I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but on the east side. It would be on here. Sorry. It's on the yes, right. on the east side of the tank, uh, which is the closest to the property line. It was on C nine, oh, I right think. Here. Yeah, but the code examiner, that's why I read it. Didn't he say he wanted it on the sides as well? No. That's what I read. It's a uh, the the wall would extend thirty inches beyond, beyond the tank in each direction from the property line. So 30 inches to the north, 30 inches to the south, and 30 inches above. Okay. All right. Uh, that's shown on S9. It shows yeah. 36 inches on S9, but the 30 inches north and south is shown on S9. Okay. Like that. Pelin, you have any questions? No. Okay. If nobody else has any other questions, we're going to go deliberate and we'll be back. All right. Thank you. Thanks for Judy. Uh, we didn't get Kaylin yet. All right. Can they hear us? Yeah. Yes. Okay. There you go. Thank you. needs to be seen to vote. Hello, Mr. Palin, welcome back. <laughs> How was lunch? <laughs> <laughs> At least I'm out of power with the WebEx. <laughs> okay. Back on the record with respect to petition number 2023-0464, Albertson Water District. Petitioner is seeking relief from 19 NYCRR, Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 5704.2.9.6.1.1. The board makes the following findings. Number one, the petitioner proposes to install an emergency diesel generator with a fuel storage tank sub base in order to power a portable, I'm sorry, potable well pump and a proposed granular activated carbon filtration system. Number two, the generator's diesel fuel tank is above grade and has a 3,244 gallon capacity. Number three, the parcel of the property on which the subject well water pumping facility and generator will be located is residential and space available for the placement of the tank is limited. Number four, the tank will be located near the east side of the property adjacent to a lot that is owned by Nassau County and is used as a sewage pumping facility. Number five, the engineer of record has determined that the subject tank will all required safety features as mandated by tables 22.4.1.1a and 22.4.1.1b of the NFPA 30-18 to be 15 feet from an adjacent lot line or property that can be built upon. Number six, setbacks provided by engineers working on the project indicate that the outer wall of the tank will be set askew to the property line that separates the subject parcel and the county-owned parcel. The setbacks for the tank, will, the tank wall will be approximately seven to eight feet from the intervening property line. Seven, the engineers have considered installing the tank at other locations on the premises, but these were deemed impractical and environmentally unsatisfactory. 
uh, number eight, the engineers on the project have also explored alternatives, including utilizing propane and natural gas fuel generate, generators, but those alternatives are considered infeasible and expensive. Number nine, the closest building to the proposed location of the tank on the adjacent lot is approximately 20 feet away. Number 10, petitioner has proposed to install an eight inch thick masonry blast wall between the tank and the east property line. This wall will extend three feet as denoted on in drawing S9 above the top of the tank and a minimum of 30 inches beyond the north and south sides of the tank. 11, the proposed tank is a double wall structure with the outer wall providing secondary fuel containment. And 12, the Board of Review only has the authority to grant a variance from the Uniform Code, and if the petitioner may need to obtain a variance from Nassau County with respect to any more restrictive local standards for construction adopted by pursuant to Executive Law 379. Okay, with respect to 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2025 Code of New York State, Section 5704.2.9.6.1.1, the board finds strict compliance with the provisions to the Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code would entail practical difficulties or unnecessary hardship and would create an excessive and, and unreasonable economic burden and would be physically or legally impractical. And the granting of this variance will not substantially adversely affect the Uniform Code provisions for health, safety, and security. Wherefore, it is determined that the application for a variance from the provisions of 19 NYCRR Part 1225, the 2020 Fire Code of New York State, Section 5704.2.9.6.1.1 B and is hereby proposed to be granted with the following conditions. Number one, that an eight inch thick masonry blast wall as shown on drawing S9 shall be installed between the tank and the east property line. This wall shall extend three feet above the tank, above the top of the tank and a minimum of 30 inches beyond the north and south sides of the tank. Number two, that the outer wall of the tank shall be located a minimum of seven feet from the east lot line. Number three, that the tanks shall only contain class two fuels. And number four, that all other provisions of the uniform code applicable to the installation of the subject tank shall be complied with. So I need a motion to approve with conditions. So moved. May I get a second? Mr. Second. Pavone, second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Mr. Palin, aye. aye. Motion is approved. Furthermore, it should be noted that the decision of this board is limited to the specific building and application before it as contained within the petition and should not be interpreted to give implied approval of any general plans, specifications presented in support of this application. Okay, we approve with those four conditions. Do you have any questions? No questions. Um, All right. Other than when is this going to be posted online? Uh, 2025. <laughs> 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 what are we running about? Um, uh, what is six uh, weeks? The, the, the recording of this determination will be up on the website maybe tomorrow. So, oh, you know, well, yeah, there's a recording um, that's posted on on our um, website. Okay. But but the written determination it may take about four to six weeks. Okay, Mr. Egan, good job. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and the Thank consideration. You. Okay, have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care.